Breastfeeding Coalition's webinar. I'm Kinkini Banerjee, the Senior Manager of Coalition's Relations at USBC, and I'm so glad to have you join us today. This series is jointly hosted by CDC's Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity, and by USBC. The webinars referred to as the 222 are held on the second Tuesdays of even-numbered months from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. And the purpose of this series is to bring together breastfeeding coalitions to share best practices and news and to network and collaborate on issues of national significance. We alternate the sessions bringing you highlights of initiatives from our national member organizations as well as from state and local partners. Coalition members and breastfeeding advocates from around the country can join us for these free webinars. Join the coalition's learning connection to get our announcements. Topic and speaker details are generally set uh, one to two weeks in uh, before each session, and they are also available on our public website. Session details are also posted in the Coalition Learning Connection. So if you haven't joined either of these, our Learning Connection, please um, do join. There are lots of good information, announcements, and resources that are shared through this Learning Connection. To streamline access, these webinars have now been set up as a series, so you only need to register for the series once, and then you will automatically receive reminders before each of these webinars with the topic and speaker details and we know that you may not be able to attend every session live so the series registration will send you auto reminders to the live link event link as well as to our archives following this session the regional meetings will be conducted over the phone as you know CDC provides five phone lines per state for these regional meetings and the meetings are a venue for coalition leaders and members to continue the discussion of today's topic and also to network. Every state coalition's primary contact person has the phone access information, so please contact your coalition to learn how participation in the regional calls is arranged. The webinar presentation, handouts, and video recordings of this and past sessions can be found on the coalition's webinar page and also on your um, a confirmation email that you got. So I'll show you how you get to that um, page. You go to our website, um, www.usbreastfeeding.org, and you can see on the last tab on our menu, click on coalitions, and it will open a drop-down menu and go to the CDC USBC bi-monthly webinars, and you can um, access uh, the handouts, the slides for this uh, session, as well as uh, recordings and all the materials from our previous sessions. During today's session, all participants are in listen-only mode. We encourage you to submit your questions during the session. Uh, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A at the end of the presentation, and you can type your questions at any time during the session, and then we'll, I will uh, pass them on to our speakers. And here's how you do it. On the right of your screen, you should see your control panel. And if you don't, it might be minimized if you don't see it. So um, you need to, uh, you'll see an orange tab. Just click on it and it'll pop back out. Uh, scroll down and just under the audio tab is the blue tab with questions. Click on it and it'll open up a box for you to type in. If you have any webinar-related tech problems or audio issues today, please email coalitions at usbreastfeeding.org, and our staff will be do their best to help you. And that brings me to today's session, using MPINK data to support breastfeeding quality improvement efforts in California. Hospital practices in the first hours and days after birth can make a difference in whether and how long babies are breastfed. CDC's National Survey of Maternity Practices in Infant Nutrition and Care, or MPINC, is administered every two years to monitor and examine changes in practice at, um, over time at all registered maternity hospitals and birth centers throughout the U.S. and territories. CDC publishes state-level MPINC benchmark reports. Today, the California Department of Public Health will share how they use MPINC data to monitor the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative 
10 Steps to Successful Breastfeeding and Inform and Target Breastfeeding Quality Improvement Efforts in Hospitals Throughout California. This session will also highlight how CDPH publishes county and regional MPINC benchmark reports providing local stakeholders with data to monitor progress in maternity care policies and practices that support breastfeeding mothers throughout California. <clears throat> I'm delighted to introduce our presenter, Karina Sariva. Ms. Sariva earned a master's in public health with an emphasis in nutrition from UC Berkeley. As a, research, as a researcher with the California Department of Public Health, she provides support for the planning, implementation, and evaluation of public health nutrition programs targeting maternal and child populations. As a lead researcher on breastfeeding, she compiles data to monitor progress towards achieving Healthy People 2020 objectives for breastfeeding initiation, duration, and exclusivity, and also hospital and worksite support for breastfeeding mothers and infants in the state of California. Many of you participated in the town hall teleconference hosted by CDC this October to mark the release of the Vital Science Report um, that presented information and trends on hospital support for breastfeeding. And you heard a brief report from Karina during the town hall. And this is an op opportunity for us to hear from her in greater detail. And with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to Karina. Okay. Thank you, Kinkini. Um, hopefully, my screen is up there. Um, we see it, Karina. Yeah. Yes, you're Thank on. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to share how the California Department of Education um, public health, I'm sorry, is using MPINC data to support breastfeeding quality improvement efforts in California hospitals. The momentum for evidence-based maternity care that supports breastfeeding continues to build. In addition to various national initiatives emphasizing the importance of hospital breastfeeding support, California has successfully passed two laws that will support our hospitals as they move towards becoming more breastfeeding friendly. In 2011, the California legislature, legislature passed a law that requires hospitals to implement the first step of the baby-friendly 10 steps. This law requires that all hospitals providing maternity services have an infant feeding policy that supports breastfeeding using the baby-friendly hospital initiative or the California model hospital policy recommendations as a guide by January 2014 and that the policy be posted and routinely communicated to staff. <clears throat> a more recent piece of legislation aims to support hospitals in adopting the baby-friendly designation or an alternate process, such as our California model hospital recommendations by 2025. Over the past five years, that ha there has been progress in increasing our in-hospital breastfeeding initiation rate. The rate of any breastfeeding increased from 91% in 2010 to 94% in 2014, while exclusive breastfeeding rates increased from 57 to 67%. However, more work is still needed to reduce the proportion of breastfed newborns who are supplemented with formula while in the hospital. Over a quarter of our newborns are still being supplemented with formula during the hospital stay. <clears throat> With these new legislative requirements, it's important for our department to also track the number of baby-friendly hospitals in California. This slide shows the progress in the number of baby-friendly hospitals in our state from six back in 2003 to 78 as of this month. This is out of approximately 250 maternity hospitals statewide. It is important to note that an additional 80 hospitals are currently at one of the phases of the 4D pathway towards baby-friendly designation. However, what we found is that not all women giving birth have equal access to this quality maternity health care services, as baby-friendly hospitals are not evenly distributed throughout the state. Baby-friendly hospitals are clustered around the Bay Area greater Sacramento and southwestern coastal region of the state. Some regions of the state with the lowest exclusive breastfeeding rates 
shown in the darker orange shades, such as the Central Valley, have limited access to quality maternity care that supports breastfeeding. Given all these developments and requirements in California, we find the MPINC survey immensely important to track key indicators of quality breastfeeding support services in our birthing hospitals. I'll first give you a little bit of background about MPINC and then go into detail on how we as a State Department are using this valuable data source. MPINC, as many of you probably know, is a national survey of maternity care practices and policies conducted by the CDC every other year among all birthing facilities. Approximately 80% of our birthing hospitals in California participate. The CDC provides state-level MPINC reports to state health departments to facilitate our work with hospitals in improving breastfeeding care. Through a data use agreement with the CDC, we sought to obtain MPINC data for our California hospitals so that we could provide regional and county level MPINC data to our local stakeholders. The MPINC measures practices and policies related to the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding, as well as labor and delivery practices and postpartum care practices. The survey has a total of 50 to 60 questions, some of which are then categorized into seven maternity care dimensions. Points are assigned to each question with higher points being given to practices that are more supportive of breastfeeding. There are um, a total of eight scores on a zero to 100 scale, seven subscores for each of the seven care dimensions measured by the MPINC survey, as well as an overall composite MPINC score. I encourage you to visit the CDC MPINC website for any additional information on the survey or the scoring methodology. Next slide. So here's a summary of the seven dimensions of care within the MPINC survey. Several of my slides later on will just reference to the um, dimension as labeled here in the table. But I wanted to give you an insight into the types of um, indicators included in that subcategory. So labor and delivery includes um, early skin to skin and breastfeeding initiation. Feeding of breastfed infants assesses supplemental supplementation practices. Um, breastfeeding assistants examine staff assessment and advise on breastfeeding and pacifier use. Mother and infant contact documents instances of mother infant separation and rooming in. Facility discharge care examines assurance of post-discharge breastfeeding support and whether gift packs containing formula are distributed. Staff training includes education and assessment of staff competency and breastfeeding support. And the structural and organizational aspects of care delivery looks at whether um, the facility has a comprehensive breastfeeding policy in place. <laughs> One way to benchmark how we as a state are doing is by um, to look at our MPINC scores across these seven dimensions of care compared to the national average scores. And we can see that overall California, which is shown in blue, is scoring higher than the nation on each of these dimensional scores. And similar to other states, we use our um, statewide MPINC benchmark data provided by the CDC to track progress or how we're doing. Since the inception of the MPINC survey in 2007, the data are shown in blue, the California total MPINC composite score rose from 69 to 83 in 2013, data shown in green. While improvements occurred within all dimensions of care assessed by the MPINC survey, marked improvements occurred in labor delivery care while more work is still needed to improve discharge support offered to breastfeeding mothers, as well as staff training. Just last month, <clears throat> the CDC published MPINC results demonstrating the need for more widespread implementation of the baby-friendly 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. These publications highlight key MPINC indicators consistent with the 10 steps and showed progress within each step between 2007 and 2013. In California, we are also interested in tracking implementation of the baby-friendly 10 steps 
in order to track progress in each of the steps and to identify areas in need of improvement in order to better target our efforts and resources. The MPINC survey data has also been useful to track implementation of the model breastfeeding policies that include all 10 elements of a comprehensive policy, which as many on, on the call know, includes staff training, prenatal education, documentation of mother's infant feeding plans, early initiation of breastfeeding and maintenance of lactation, no supplementation of breastfed infants, rooming in, breastfeeding on demand, discouraging passive use, and providing referrals and other breastfeeding support at discharge. This slide here shows that in 2007, only 18% of California hospitals reported having a model breastfeeding policy. This has been gradually improving to 43% of hospitals in 2013. We will continue to monitor this indicator to assess how well hospitals are complying with recent legislative requirements for such policies effective January 2014. And we expect this indicator to improve significantly in the MPINC 2015 reporting period. In order to track progress over time, it's also important to observe which elements have already been adopted by most facilities and which elements hospitals are struggling with. We find that elements which still need wider adoption are policies related to supplementation of breastfed infants, appropriate staff training, providing prenatal breastfeeding classes, and policies related to pacifier use. The MPINC indicator used to track step two on staff training is whether nurses are assessed for competency in basic breastfeeding management and support at least once per year. We see steady improvement in this indicator, with just over half of birthing hospitals affirming this statement in 2007, compared to 71% in 2013. As for the NPINC indicator on whether breastfeeding education is included as a routine element of prenatal classes, more hospitals responded affirmatively to the statement in 2007 compared to 2013. We are concerned that opportunities for breastfeeding prenatal education is slowly diminishing, and we will continue to monitor this indicator closely. Early initiation of breastfeeding is defined by the MPINC survey as 90% or more of healthy full-term breastfed infants initiating breastfeeding within one hour of an uncomplicated vaginal birth. Less than half of our hospitals agreed with the statement in 2007, compared to over three quarters of our hospitals indicating such in 2013. For step five, the percent of California hospitals indicating that 90% or more of mothers who are breastfeeding or intend to breastfeed are taught breastfeeding techniques has been gradually increasing from 83% in 2007 to 94% in 2013. One area in need of improvement is limited use of supplements. Only 14% of California hospitals indicated that less than 10% of healthy full-term breastfed infants are supplemented with formula, glucose water, or water in 2007. And even in 2013, less than one quarter of our hospitals are meeting this benchmark. Another area that continues to gradually improve is the practice of healthy full-term infants rooming in with their mother for at least 23 hours per day during the hospital stay, increasing from 59% in 2007 to 79% in 2013. The MPINC survey also captures an indicator of whether 90% or more of mothers are tar taught to recognize and respond to infant feeding cues instead of feeding on a set schedule. In 2007, 69% of our hospitals agreed with the statement compared to 90% in 2013. Only one third of California hospitals responded that less than 10% of healthy full-term breastfed infants are given pacifiers by maternity care staff members in 2007. 
This indicator increased to two-thirds of our hospitals by 2013. Another area that California hospitals are lagging behind relates to providing three modes of post-discharge support to breastfeeding women, including physical contact, um, including a home visit or a hospital visit, actively reaching out, such as a follow-up call and referrals, including lists of contacts and support groups. In 2007, less than one quarter of our hospitals resp responded that they provided mothers with multi-modes of post-discharge breastfeeding support. In 2013, this remains low at less than one-third. The MPING survey also provides data on each of the types of discharge care offered. What we found is that most California hospitals provide referrals, but the most effective discharge care physical contact, such as a follow-up visit or home visit, remain rare. Another MPINC indicator that we have been actively tracking is the percentage of California hospitals distributing discharge packs containing infant formula samples to breastfeeding mothers. In 2007, approximately half of our hospitals indicated they did distribute gift packs with formula. This has decreased significantly to only 13% in 2013. <clears throat> this slide provides a summary measure of progress in implementing the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. The darker blue shades represent um, the percentage that only implemented 0 to 2 and 3 to 5 steps, respectively. In 2007, the pie chart on the left shows that the majority um, of the California hospitals had implemented less than half of the steps, shown in dark blue. By 2013, you can see that the darker shades of blue decreased, indicating that only one-fourth of the hospitals had only implemented five or less of the steps. A majority, nearly three-quarters of our hospitals, have implemented more than half of the 10 steps. So in summary, using state-level MPINC survey results provided by the CDC, we found that between 2007 and 2013, California's MPINC composite score increased from 69, which is rank 11, to 83, rank 7 in the U.S. Improvements occurred within all dimensions with marked improvement in labor and delivery care, discharge care, and structural and organizational aspects of care delivery. However, the following areas still need improvement. Inclusion of model breastfeeding policy elements, adequate staff training and assessment, appropriate use of breastfeeding supplements, and provision of hospital discharge planning support beyond referrals. Now I'll briefly highlight two additional projects using MPINC data. In 2009, the California Department of Public Health initiated a data sharing agreement with the CDC to obtain our MPINC survey responses for California hospitals in order to link hospital level breastfeeding initiation data from our newborn screening program and other hospital characteristics to allow for local level analysis. There were two main components of this project. The more practical component was to provide local breastfeeding stakeholders with MPINC data to utilize in their quality improvement work with area hospitals. We also wanted to build a strong case for evidence-based maternity care in California by exploring the association of maternity care practices as measured by the CDC's MPINC survey and exclusive in-hospital breastfeeding initiation rates among California hospitals. I will cover the research project briefly and then discuss how we will utilize MPINC data in our work with local breastfeeding stakeholders, highlighting activities in Alameda and Contra Costa counties. <coughs> so early on in this project, we explored the association between MPINC scores and hospital exclusive breastfeeding rates. Using MPINC 2007 data, we looked at the average in hospital exclusive breastfeeding rates among low-scoring hospitals with scores below 60, shown in red, and those scoring moderate, scores between 60 and 79.9, shown in orange, and high, scores of 80 or above, shown in green. 
we observed a statistically significant difference in the average exclusive breastfeeding rates among hospitals with low, moderate, and high end pink scores, with low scoring hospitals having the lowest average exclusive breastfeeding rates, and hospitals with scores of 80 or above having the highest average exclusive breastfeeding rate. We have also used MPING 2011 data to highlight disparities in maternity care practices by examining MPING scores by the proportion of the hospital birthing population receiving Medi-Cal, categorizing hospitals into quartiles based on the proportion of their birthing population on Medi-Cal. We found that hospitals in the lowest quartile with less than one-third of their birth population on Medi-Cal, shown in gray, had much higher MPING scores than those hospitals in the highest quartile, where nearly three-quarters of their birthing population was on Medi-Cal, shown in orange. The biggest disparity was in labor and delivery practice score, which includes early skin-to-skin -skin and breastfeeding initiation. And again, we see worse discharge support offered in hospitals serving the most at-risk population. But the most important goal for us in California was to utilize MPINK data to inform, influence, and monitor change in breastfeeding support at the local level. Using the linked MPINK data, we developed and disseminated regional and county level benchmark reports designed to communicate directly with our local partners most able to influence hospital policies and practices and raise awareness and encourage hospitals participate in MPINK 2015, utilize MPINK data to initiate quality improvement projects within the maternity care setting, and to collaborate to address barriers to evidence-based maternity care policies and practices. In 2013, CDPH produced MPINK benchmark reports for each of the 11 regional perinatal programs of California, listed here, or RPPCs as well as counties that had at least five hospitals participating in the MPINK survey, listed below. <clears throat> this slide shows the distribution of our RPPCs, which group maternity hospitals into 11 geographic areas throughout the state. Each region has an RPPC coordinator available for consultation and technical assistance. RPPC staff are uniquely qualified to assist hospitals with maternity care quality improvement. They routinely provide resources, consultation, and technical assistance on quality improvement activities. They conduct yearly on-site visits where they review existing data, including MPINK results, to identify areas in need of improvement. They have established relationships with staff at local hospitals and they assist in developing communication networks between agencies, providers, and other organizations to exchange information and share best practices. The WIC Regional Breastfeeding Liaisons, or RBLs, are another important regional partner that often use the MPINK survey data in their work. RBLs are WIC professional staff from a variety of public health, medical, and marketing backgrounds. They foster relationships between WIC and local hospitals, providers, breastfeeding coalitions, employers, and other community partners with the goal of ensuring seamless breastfeeding support is available to WIC participants in their community. This map shows areas throughout California with an R, um, WIC RBL. Although they're not in every county in the state, they are located in the areas with the highest proportion of births to low-income women. I wanted to share a case study of how one of our local stakeholders um, working as a WIC RBL in Alameda and Contra Costa counties decided to partner with the RPPC coordinator uh, for the East Bay region. They saw the MPINK benchmark reports as an opportunity to bring together local hospitals, medical providers, and local programs serving maternal and child populations, such as the Black Infant Health Program, the WIC program and the home, home visiting program to encourage full participation in MPINK so that they could um, get their individual county level benchmark reports for each Alameda and Contra Costa counties. 
to review the most recent MPINC data and breastfeeding outcomes together, to celebrate areas where the hospitals are providing quality care, and to identify priority areas in need of improvement, such as coordinated discharge planning and staff training. Together, they initiated a regional breastfeeding quality improvement task force that provided education, including training on model breastfeeding policy development and quality improvement methods for organizational change, action planning, assessment of MPINC and other data, identifying priorities and developing a quality improvement plan, and setting goals to monitor progress. This task force also allowed participate participants to discuss barriers to evidence-based maternity care and share best practices, and established opportunities for collaboration with local WIC and other medical and MCH providers to improve post-discharge support for breastfeeding women in their community. I'm happy to report that they have several innovative projects aimed at improving the continuum of care for postpartum breastfeeding women in the Bay Area with some promising preliminary results. <clears throat> I'm going to conclude with discussing a little bit about next steps and future planned analyses using MPINC data. Um, we will continue to monitor and disseminate MPINC survey results at both the state and local level. We will explore hospital performance on MPINC and breastfeeding rates by key patient demographic profiles, such as percent of Medi-Cal births or percent of the population receiving WIC, et cetera. Using this information, um, we will identify high-performing hospitals from which we can learn best practices and, and low-performing hospitals in need of targeted interventions or resources. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the CDC for their ongoing partnership in getting these data to our local stakeholders. State-level MPINC data and additional information on the MPINC survey is available on the CDC MPINC survey website shown here. I leave you with my contact information and a link to our California Breastfeeding Statistics website where our MPINC data products can be downloaded. Thank you. Wonderful, Karina. Thank you so much that for a terrific presentation and so timely as funding and support for breastfeeding initiatives uh, in every state ha has, has, has grown, uh, it has spurred discussion and action among stakeholders uh, from state, tribal, local, and territorial health officials, health, education, health educators, clinicians about breast practices, opportunities, and challenges around hospital support for breastfeeding. And as the Vital Signs uh, report showed, the percentage of U.S. hospitals implementing a majority of the 10 steps increased from 29% in 2007 to nearly 54% in um, 2011. Um, and I want to, uh, as we open up for questions, I want to thank our coalitions who have been actively engaged in connecting with uh, breastfeeding um, have been, as the 2015 MPINC National Survey has been conducted in the last three months, our coalitions have been actively engaged connecting with the birthing facilities in your states, informing them to expect calls from CDC and encouraging um, them to participate. So um, thank you for that and we are going to open for questions. Uh, I want to also let you know that our CDC friends are on the call, um, so please feel free um, to jump in and uh, give your um, input at any time, Carol McGowan, Kelly Scanlon, and Catherine Shealy. Um, so um, Karina, can you talk a little bit more about the partnerships that CDC has established, especially at the local levels, the RPPCs and the RBLs, and those were great. So um, you said that there were some innovative projects that are ongoing, so if you could just elaborate, uh, share some more details on that. Well, I wasn't going to share any details on those projects only because they will be presented at our upcoming um, breastfeeding summit in um, February by those local partners because they do have some evaluation results that they'll be sharing. Um, 
I'm just excited that they've taken this data as a way to really inform um, their strategy of really connecting that post-discharge support from hospital onto early postpartum period. Um, I could talk a little bit more about how, as a department, um, we have an ongoing partnership with the California Breastfeeding Coalition. Um, they help us um, by broad-based, providing broad-based email announcements to our local breastfeeding coalitions, letting them know when new MPINK data are available and encouraging them to use this data. We've also partnered with them on planning the annual breastfeeding summit that's coming up in a couple months. Mm -hmm. This also provides us a great opportunity to present MPINK results to a broader audience of hospitals and community partners. Um, we've also partnered with the California WIC Association, um, who also send out email announcements to their local WIC agencies. Um, and often include MPINK data dissemination in their um, newsletter publications and such. And of course, our regional RPPCs and RBLs that work day to day with their local hospitals and the community program in reviewing MPINK results and identifying opportunities to improve maternity care services in their communities. So we're really appreciative of the ongoing partnership and the collaborative effort around this. Great. Thank you, Karina. And as you can see, um, that that very close partnership between the state public health department, the WIC program, and the state WIC association, and the state breastfeeding coalition, that these strong partnerships make it possible uh, for you to do this over such a vast um, state um, as well. Um, our, we have a question which says, how did you get the distribution of MPING scores of individual hospitals? Did you, the, or the arrangement that you made with CDC, did you have to get them? Um, and how, could you tell us a little bit more about the, um, the uh, arrangement with CDC? Yeah, so, and um, the CDC colleagues can jump in, but essentially, um, Right when it started being available, we asked whether we as a state department, um, head state department in, turn, in charge of maternity care practices, could receive that data set. Um, they did have a data use agreement form or a structured process for requesting those data. Of course, they were de-identified um, and we had to abide by some guidelines where we would not um, identify individual hospitals and anything that we report. I don't know if they want to add anything to that process, but usually state departments can request their data. This is we, awesome, CC. I would just add in that this is um, a really great example of an opportunity to collaborate with your state health department and um, that a coalition that um, if someone's in a coalition and is not part of the state health department, um, it's a great opportunity to, you know, this, this really would be a strategic partnership because they may have the people power to get and, and process the data but not to do the communication efforts like with the people power that are available in California. And so um, it would be very straightforward to replicate the process that Karina has created. Um, and as she said, there's a, um, you do a request for a data sharing agreement and it's a very straightforward process. And it's also part of the um, statewide obesity project funding that all of those projects um, know that they also can access their state level data um, if they are interested. Terrific. Yeah, we have a lot of questions about those Catherine cats. So that's good about how um, to get those. And then, um, of course, a question about whether the 2015 MPINK surveys have been sent out. Yes, and yes, I guess uh, any, um, um, I know that they've been going on for the last three months, started in October, right, um, Catherine, Karen? Uh, yeah, so the, the current survey, the 2015 survey um, is in the field, the screening and the um, and the participation is currently underway. Um, it, it took a little bit longer to get off the ground um, than it has in the past, but it's, um, it's underway. Um, so not time for panicking yet. If you haven't seen it come down the pike, um, it, it will be coming to you soon if you haven't seen it yet. 
thank you. And we have a question from one of our coalition folks asking, do, is there a way to find out which birthing facilities have completed the MPING survey, I guess, um, and how do we urge them to, you know, if they haven't? So we don't release publicly who has completed it so far. Um, probably down the road once we are confident that we've reached out to everyone that we know of and that everyone has had an opportunity to um, respond, um, that we might um, have some activities to, to help um, pick up the laggards, so to speak. Uh, but in the meantime, a, a general encouragement to hospitals um, to be on the lookout for it and to you know, to really make sure that they understand the value add to themselves to participating versus just a, a begging and pleading to improve the response rate. Um, that, I think, is one of the most effective ways to uh, work with the hospitals, that it's, the opportunity is going to be there if they haven't seen it come out yet, and, um, and that it actually can be really helpful to them individually as a hospital to participate because of the reports they get back and the other activities that they can do using their own data. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Kat. And um, there's some, uh, there's a question about, you know, monitoring the accuracy of the data collection. And again, this is self-reported, but if you have um, any insights on that, um, CDPH, CDC folks. Um, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Will you go first and I could just add something to it? Well, I was going to say one of the things that I think is, is really um, beautiful and tangible reassurance about um, the accuracy of the data are the slides that Karina presented showing um, how we can really track other um, indicators um, of the hospitals that align very closely to the practices that are being um, evaluated in the MPINC survey show that they are actually collecting real data. Um, a concern that um, folks have had from the very beginning about whether someone will be honest in completing the survey, um, sure, that's always a concern, and yes, they are self-report, but the, the structure of the survey is intentionally designed to be able to make it, to really um, eliminate as much as possible um, a, a logical motivation to misrepresent a hospital, and I think that gets back to this value add that um, it really, you know, it's, it's, it's no skin off anyone else's back if, if it's incorrect information, but it doesn't really help the hospital to be disingenuous in participating. Um, and in fact, you know, the more, uh, the more honestly they participate, the, the more valuable it is to them. Um, and also the, the way that the questions are created with the ranges um, are really aiming to capture, you know, if we were to walk into your hospital or if someone were to walk into your hospital, what would they see? Would you look like a hospital that does this or do you look like a hospital that does this? Um, versus, you know, saying the 63.5% of babies in your hospital, you know, go skin to skin immediately after birth, et cetera. Um, and so it's important to keep in mind that the entire methodology is structured to make it a, a really valuable tool first and foremost to the hospital itself, but then also to support public health activities exactly like the ones that Karina has been uh, discussing today. Really helpful to get that perspective. And as coalitions, you connect with your hospitals. Um, this really is gives you the language about the value that they have in um, participating in this survey. Um, Karina, did you want to add to that? Yeah, in addition to, um, as I've shown in our slide here about the better breastfeeding data or exclusivity of breastfeeding in the hospital, the higher the score, a quick check I always do is how are the baby-friendly hospitals in that given year that we know they're baby-friendly or they got designated recently, like how are baby-friendly hospitals scoring? And of course, they're always in the high 80s, 90s much higher. The other high-performing hospitals are um, Kaiser, who aren't necessarily baby-friendly, but we know that they have their own um, model exemplary program that they're going through, similar to our California model breastfeeding policy recommendations. So I think by comparing it to those types of indicators, we could see that MPINC really is measuring um, how successful they are in providing quality breastfeeding support. 
Thank you. And a question about the data shared use agreement, and is it something that CDC only does with the state health departments? Is there any possibility for researchers at state universities to be able to have the um, access to MPing data sets um, local level? Uh, so the the sort of written into the um, survey is the ability to use the data for research and public health programs. Um, anyone who's interested in accessing the data can um, send a request to us um, uh, to be able to complete the data sharing agreement and um, and work out from there um, what data they'd be able to have access to. Um, but then also it's important to keep in mind that on our website cdc.gov/mpink. Um, are the um, complete web tables. And a lot of the data that um, Karina put up, in addition to um, the state specific pieces that she was able to get via the um, data sharing agreement, also are available directly off of our website um, on the, the web table. So you can actually get really, really far just on what we provide to everybody. But anyone who's interested in accessing more specific data for research or for public health program can um, send in a request for the data sharing agreement. Right, terrific. And a last question. Um, um, just uh, if you can, you know, speak to Karina about some of the barriers that folks have that that are in the field with um, dealing with hospital administrators or CEO to get buy-in from hospital administrators at that level. So some of the work that your RBLs or RPCCs have done in building those uh, networks? Well, I guess one barrier um, that I've heard, because um, I'm not out on the ground, is obviously you put in a lot of effort with a certain CEO or administrator. They go through the training, you get their buy-in, and there's turnover. Um, so a lot of administrative change, a lot of the nursing staff being trained and then shifting to other facilities. Um, another barrier yeah, is the staff time in terms of getting that, the training hours and funding the additional staff to be on the floor um, poses a barrier. It's not just the cost of becoming baby friendly um, in terms of the process, but costs related to the staff training and having multiple staff um, on the floor during trainings and of course turnover on either the staff level or at the CEO level. Is it constant barrier where they pick up and then they have to start over and get get new administration on board. Great. Thank you, uh, Karina, again for this uh, terrific presentation. And as we know, all the slides and the materials are on the um, our website. And also the CDPH website that Karina mentioned is a great um, site for resources as well. And now it's time for updates from CDC. And I'm going to invite Kelly Scanlon, Chief of DNPAO at CDC, to um, uh, share some CDC news with us. Uh, hi, everyone. This is actually Carol McGowan. I'm going to be doing the updates for Kelly on behalf of Kelly. Um, we just have a few, so it won't take long. Um, Kat already gave you a, a nice overview of where we are with the MPINK survey in the field. We just wanted to make sure that you were reassured that, that the hospitals that haven't responded yet will not be shut out at this point because the survey is still out there and the calls are still being made to hospitals. Um, our team here at CDC is close to finalizing an MPINK redesign for MPINK 2017 and it's currently being field tested, so uh, keep your ears open for that. And as we get closer to 2017, we'll probably give you additional information on how that the new survey is um, slightly different, um, well, a lot different from the current one. So um, we want to, we're very excited that our best fed beginnings, our BFB um, hospitals continue to get designated, even though the BFB or best fed beginnings project um, is actually has come to an end. Um, the hospitals are still going through. We now have 65 of the 89 hospitals in that project have been designated as baby friendly. Um, in terms of Empower, our new uh, our new project that is in, um, that that is subsequent to the, to the best fed beginnings, um, each of our selected hospitals has received a coaching team visit. 
Um, and we're finding these to be very useful. Um, as each coaching team goes to the hospital early on in this process, they're, they're being able to identify unique and specific uh, technical assistance needs early on um, and able to help the hospitals get on board with working towards baby friendly. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, currently, um, big announcement, we are at 15.7% of our U.S. babies are born in baby friendly designated hospitals. That's 315 hospitals in 48 states. So that is a major accomplishment. Um, we were hoping we would reach 15% by the end of the year, and we uh, have surpassed that at this point. And um, a final announcement, which is a sad one for us, and um, I'm sure for everybody who's benefited from her work, uh, Dr. Janet Collins, who's the director of our Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity, um, is set to retire on December 31st. And just to let you know, um, behind the scenes and, um, and in front of the scenes also, Dr. Collins has been a huge supporter of the work that we've done in breastfeeding and really has um, been a champion for the work that we, we have done here. And we're very sad to see her go. Um, hopefully, um, we will find another champion to replace her um, as we look for a, a new director um, across the country. And I think that's it for today. Thank you, Carol. Well, big news, and this is huge news about the 15%. That's just the, the entire field um, should be celebrating. We have a long ways to go, but this is wonderful news. And then moving on, I'm going to share some updates um, from USBC. And um, there are just so many new coalition supports that we've given at this year. So um, at the uh, very soon we'll be releasing uh, an email with uh, with uh, that'll give you a recording and slides of the highlights of 2015, all the coalition support highlights. So it'll be a recording that you can listen to on your own time. We know taking time in the middle of the day, so we don't want to add yet another <laughs> webinar to your already full schedule. As you can see that in 2014 we had just the 222 and since then we now have four different webinar series, the power tools, the racial equity and the collective impact. So watch out for that email which tells you the, uh, which gives you the recording of the highlights for coalition support that you can, if there's one place you need to go to and find out all the good things that the coalitions capacity building support have come, it will be this recording. And please, please be sure to join the Coalition Learning Connection. It's just really a good place for resources and for networking, so we hope to meet you there. Our um, second piece of update is that we had done the needs assessment in 2013, which gave us a benchmark level of information about uh, you know where coalitions were in terms of uh, their functioning and, and their structures and that helped us build a lot of the capacity building support that we've done in the last year, year and a half. And we worked with CDC to devise uh, coalition indicators for breastfeeding report card again based on the needs assessment data. And um, the purpose of this is to better communicate uh, to our federal partners the state of the state coalitions. We want to use this also as an advocacy tool to enhance and uh, sustain uh, support for coalitions. So watch out for an abbreviated leader survey that will be launched this month to ensure that we have up-to-date data transferred to CDC in February. And our plan is to have um, these indicators, coalition indicators in the 2016 uh, breastfeeding report card. So again, we will be recording a video explaining how these indicators will be calculated and you'll see that, we'll, you'll have that video recording explaining that when you get the updated uh, leader survey in a couple of weeks. And uh, well, we are starting planning for our 2016 uh, coalitions conference. This is going to be in August. And this month, at the end of this month, we'll be sending out calls for proposals. And it is time. Uh, stay tuned for um, emails about that. And there's a variety of opportunities to apply to present about, about the work your coalition does, either in breakout panel sessions, as breakfast table topics, or poster presentations 
organizations. So as of now, we do have funding for um, subsidized attendees from at least two from every state. So we look forward to getting input from you and uh, to, again, uh, planning a really meaningful and educational 2016 conference. And with that, we are out of time. And thank you so much for being with us again. Um, wishes for happy holidays and thanks for all you do. Until next time, goodbye.